All right, following from, from uh, last week's theme of just uh, getting encouragement from Old Testament examples of people living under oppressive times, I did allude to Daniel's story last week, so I thought I would uh, just cover a bit of Daniel's story today. Uh, not so much for what he's famous for, but you know this uh, early part of his life when they were actually uh, children, uh, as described in this chapter, and um, get a few lessons from this. And like the song we sung, you know, dare to be a Daniel, that you would dare to have some attributes that we see in Daniel, one of the great men of God in the Bible that we'll look at. But let's just go over this chapter just quickly, um, just so we know what's happening in this chapter. If you're not so familiar with the story, obviously Daniel is a very famous character in the Bible. A lot of people know about him, you know, being thrown into the lion's den and God closed up the mouths of the lions. Uh, we're not so much looking at that today, but uh, what he stood and took a stand for in uh, Daniel chapter 1. So let's uh, just go through this chapter quickly. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So if you're wondering where Daniel kind of sits in the timeline of the nation of Israel, you know, uh, where he was, you know, this is when they went into captivity under Nebuchadnezzar, right? And he was one of the children that was, you know, in the nation at the time when they were taken into captivity. And you see um, him and his life as under captivity, you know, under Nebuchadnezzar and, and the kings that followed uh, and nations that followed after that. So this is kind of setting the scene, these first two verses, um, showing you that Daniel is not living in ideal circumstances, right? He is living in an oppressive time under a different nation where they are trying to change the traditions and the customs of the Israelites into their own uh, Babylonian customs and pagan traditions and all this sort of stuff. So there's like a pressure, if you think about it, from, you know, the government at the time. Verse 3, And the king spake unto Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So you can see here that the king now wants to look out amongst the children of Israel and take the very best, the people that have the most talent, the most ability, the children that sort of like are, are outstanding. And now he wants to, you know, teach them his culture and his practices and they, you know, make them sure they change their dress. You know, it, they, you see later, he even changes their names, right? And gives them Babylonian names. So changing their identity, changing their language, just, you know, tr you know completely, you know, completely different to who they were and what they stood for, right? And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king, right? So they're going to teach them and train them, these children, and after three years now they're going to present themselves to the king to show, uh, you know, how they've trained these children up, right? To, to be, I guess, good Babylonians. Now, among them, among these, were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Right? So this is how we, the famous Daniel and his three friends, these are the names of the three friends, right? Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You can even see that, you know, the Babylonian names that they're given are, are somewhat similar, right? Um, so it says here later on, unto whom the princes of the eunuchs gave names, for well, he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, that's, that was very different, right, Belteshazzar, to Hananiah of Shadrach, but this is how you can remember Mishael is Meshach, is M&M, &M, and Azariah is Abednego. Right? So I remember uh, a youth camp that I went to when I was younger and, and, and first started going to church that uh, the groups were named after Daniel and his three friends. So sometimes these names have stuck stuck with me, you know, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and, and uh, Azariah, because that's what the groups were named after. So you can see here, they're in captivity. King has taken them out and tried to now train them and teach them the ways of the Babylonians, even changed their, tried to change their language 
and given them even different identities, different names now. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he, re he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now why, why would he be defiling himself with the portion of the king's meat? Well, I believe what, what the problem with the king's food here is it was likely being offered to idols, right? And you know, the Bible, even though th there's nothing sinful in and of itself to eat food offered to idols, but then if you know they're offered to idols and the people you're eating with know they're offered to idols, you may want to refrain from eating that for their sake, right? And, and for testimony's sake. So this is why Daniel takes this stand to have this testimony to say, look, I don't want people to think it's okay to eat meat offered to idols. So he purposes in his heart to do this. But, uh, but notice in the way he does it, he doesn't just make a big fuss about it. He actually beseeches the one that is over him and doesn't just say, I'm not going to do it, but actually offers him an alternative, a solution to say, look, what if I did this? You know, you're not going to be in trouble. You know, we can be presented for the king. Prove us for 10 days. See how it's going to go first and then allow us to continue. So you can see Daniel here starts to exude even before, like, you know, the Bible talks about God giving them wisdom and visions and, and dreams and all that. You can see he's already going about life very wisely, right? He's not just obnoxious and he's not just, you know, aggressive. He goes about life very wisely in the way he beseeches authority and doesn't just say no, but or says no, but what about this, right? Like offers another way to do things. And I think that's very wise of Daniel here. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs, right? This is the, the Melzar who's looking over them, that he might not defile himself, right? So he does explain to him that he doesn't agree with eating this, uh, eating these foods. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. So it's interesting that, that God is helping Daniel to earn favor with those in authority over him, but you can also see that Daniel himself you know, God is using, you know, Daniel's wise way, how he's behaving himself wisely, like David did, to, you know, work this situation in his favor. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. You know, so sometimes, it's like with this whole COVID stuff, right, you know, and people have got the mask exemptions and stuff. Now, this is maybe the conversation you need to have with your boss that, you know, they're not so much caring about your rights and your freedoms and how you feel, right? They, they're probably thinking about their own head, like Mel's are, you know? So maybe if you can, you know, explain that, you know, there is no liability and things like that to the business, you know, that might change um, their mentality over, you know, the stand that you're taking. So that might be a wiser way to go about it. So you can see here that Melzar, you know, he's obviously worried about himself. He's saying like, well, look, if I give you your request and you don't eat the food you don't want to eat, and, you know, what, am, what are you going to eat? Like if you're eating something that's not a sustenance and then you, I present you before the king, I'm going to get in trouble because you're not going to you know, look as strong and as fit and all that sort of stuff before the king. And then he's saying here, my life will be on the line. Verse 11, then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, right? Test us, right? I beseech thee, 10 days. So he says, just let us do this for 10 days and then see how we go, right? And let them give us pulse to eat. So pulse, I understand, is just like kind of like beans, you know? And, and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants, right? So he's saying, prove us, we'll refrain from it but we'll eat pulse and just drink water let everyone else eat what you've given them if they're going to eat that and then see who you know turns out better in the end so he consented to them in this matter and proved them 10 days and at the end of 10 days their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat now we don't know how much you know you know how, how much of this is like miraculous right and in terms of miraculous and and, and it's not saying that, you know, generally pulse and water may be a more healthy diet than whatever the others were eating. But obviously God, you know, blessed them and helped them during this time to be strengthened in the sustenance that they took this stand for, even though it may have been less nutritionally dense as whatever 
uh, the others were eating. Obviously, the drink would be a lot more nutritionally um, uh, detri uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like not there, you know, deficient. Thus, Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink, and gave them pulse. Right. So now he's actually allowing them to do this because they proved that they were they could do the job. Uh, that, they, that they were good, and and sometimes this reminds me of this stand that they're taking. It, it's it's kind of like, you know, uh, and I've, I've talked with a lot of you guys in church about, it's about working on Sundays, right? You know, people work on Sundays, always worried about, yeah, well, if I don't work on Sundays, then, you know, my boss is going to think this, and then I'm like, but, you know, if you work really hard for six days of the week, and you show your boss that you're a good worker, that you're a value, then they don't mind. You know, it's kind of like this. It's like, well, test it. I'll, I'll show you what sort of worker I am, even though I don't give you that day to work, and then... If you are found to be a better employee and a you know, more faithful employee and a stronger worker and more productive, then the boss might be like, oh, that's great. I'll give you the requests that you want because you know, of, of how you are in other areas. So um, Daniel taking this stand always reminds me of things like this in our own life where we can take these small stands and, and God will bless the stand that we take. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. You know, so I'm sure there's, a, there's an element of supernatural giving of wisdom and strength here. But it's also that people that are more godly and righteous tend to be a lot more dedicated and a lot more consistent and a lot more disciplined in what they do. So, you know, I think that there's these both factors working here that because these men were men of, uh, well, these children, you know, here were children of principle and children that were disciplined and took a stand, that they probably also excelled in other areas of life too. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding, the king inquired of them. He found them 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of the king of Cyrus. So he's saying like, because the king of Cyrus was the king of Persia, right? So he's not only living through the Babylonian Empire, but he's also living through the, the Medo-Persian Empire as well. So dare to be a Daniel. What are some things that we can learn from this story? There's, uh, there's um, I think I've got how many things have I got this morning? Six things taken from this story. I want to encourage you in this morning, now that we understand what's happening in Daniel chapter 1. Now, the first point I want to encourage you in today is don't be a victim of your circumstances. Now, Daniel was not a victim of his circumstances. I mean, think about it. He is taken out of house and home. He's living in oppression. His culture, his language, his very identity, his name is taken from him. Oftentimes, people, when they are in a bad circumstances, bad situation, they, they become a victim of their circumstances. What do I mean? They blame their circumstances for why they can't excel in life. They, they say, well, I didn't get the same upbringing as somebody else. I didn't get the same opportunities, you know, all these sorts of things. Don't be a victim of your circumstances. You know, Daniel lived, like I said, in a time of oppression. He was removed from family. But, you know, in the Bible, he is remembered as one of the greatest men of God in the Bible. Right? But look at, you know, what he had to go through and look at the situation he was in. Look what Ezekiel has to say about Daniel. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out my hand upon it and will break the staff of the bread thereof and will send famine upon it and will cut off man and beast from it. So God is saying, hey, I'm going to judge this land. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they should deliver by their own souls, but their righteousness, uh, by their righteousness, saith the Lord. So I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty good to have your name mentioned alongside Noah, right? The one, only one that was <laughs> saved during a worldwide flood, right? And then Job, right, the most righteous man on the earth and went through all the testing and, you know, has a whole book in the Bible about him. Um, Daniel is named alongside that. I mean, that's quite an honorable thing that, that, that God would say, hey, even if these three men 
you would not could not save this land, right? But, the, but your name is mentioned among the three that God holds to be like, hey, these are the three top examples. Uh, if, if righteousness could save a nation, it would be these three. And Daniel is there alongside, like I said, Noah and Job. Ezekiel 28, look at this, son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, so even though this is talking about an earthly king as well, a wicked earthly king, it is also a, a, a sort of an analogy to Satan as well in this, as you, if you read all the chapter of chapter 28, you'll know that it's talking about Satan too. Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, look at this, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. I mean, to say, to, I, guess to co I guess compliment Satan in a way here, to say that he's wiser than insert name here and your name is there, that's a, that's a lot to say about how wise you are when it's saying, hey, Satan is even wiser than Daniel, right? So we can see Daniel, you know, and, he, and he's a very profound figure in the Bible as well in terms of all the visions that he's given. I mean, Dan, the book of Daniel is a huge book on prophecy and end times and a lot of wisdom and knowledge was given to Daniel um, that was not given to anyone else. Uh, and, and he's also, you know, famous for interpreting the dreams and all that of Nebuchadnezzar. So don't be a victim of your circumstances. You know, people have unideal circumstances in their lives. You know, broken families, broken relationships. Maybe it's like, you know, financial situations. You know, you, you didn't get the same financial upbringing as somebody else, right? Or, you know, maybe it's a disability. You know, people think like, well, I've got this disability. You know, that doesn't change that you can do great things for God. Or even like maybe an abusive upbringing. You know, people think like, oh, you know, I had an abusive upbringing. Like, woe is me, poor me. And I'm not downplaying people's unideal circumstances. What I'm trying to say today is, don't let your unideal circumstances, don't be a victim of those circumstances because God can help you to overcome these circumstances. And just like in Daniel's day, you know, he was not in an ideal circumstance and yet God helped him to overcome, to take the stand and to do great things for him. Don't be a victim of your circumstances. Number two, what we can learn from the story of Daniel is excel at what you do. Excel at what you do. If you remember from the story of Daniel, what, what were the children that they chose out of the children of Israel to stand before the king, to be able to have the king's ear and to be able to influence the nation like Daniel and his friends were able to influence the nation, right? Children, verse 4, children in whom was no blemish but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability to, in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Now, when I read this and I was sort of thinking about this, this is where I, I, I got this point and I was thinking, hey, whatever you do, you should try and excel at what you do because you never know the opportunities it's going to create in your life. You know, some people have the attitude as they work and as they do anything, whether it's for church or whether it's for a workplace, or whether just it's in your own hobbies or whatever you're doing in your own passions, right? Maybe you're, you run your own business. You want to excel at what you do. You want to be the best at, you can be at whatever you do, you know, whether it's, you know, making coffees or in health, working healthcare, or whether it's, you know, being an electrician. You know, be the best electrician and make the best coffee, do the best you can. You know, if you work for somebody, be the best employee you can, you know, and don't have this attitude like, oh, you know, that's not my job. You know, that's, that's, that's below me. Or that's, you know, people say things like, oh, that's above my pay grade, right? There's a difference between having so much work to do, whether you have to prioritize things and say, look, I would do it if I could, but I have to prioritize. And having the attitude of like, I just don't want to help do things that need to be done in this business. Because, you know, if you have that attitude, you'll lose out just on opportunities in your life. You know, it's not, not a wise way to live. And it's not a good testimony. And, you know, like here, they had the opportunity because of their knowledge, their skills, and, and they, they stood out amongst the children of Israel 
but it gave them this opportunity to do something great for God, be part of this story, right? So excel at what you do. Um, I've, I've often heard the saying, like, you know, people say, oh, you're lucky when you're successful, you're lucky if this happens. But you know, a lot of like, successful people in life, when they talk about, you know, overcoming and, and being successful in whatever they do, they will often say, well, luck is just when, you know, preparation meets opportunity. You know, you, you like, create those opportunities because you're prepared, you were excelling at what you did, and then you had an opportunity, and that allowed you to seize on that opportunity. Often people, when they're successful, it's, it's not about luck. You know, most people that are successful in this life, you know, that's why when you see people that are successful, it's no accident. They had to work and things like that. And we're not talking about <coughs> people that just inherit success. I mean, people that are successful, meaning they actually accomplish something in their own life. It's, it's uh, always preparation, meeting opportunity. And because they were prepared, because they're excelling at what they do, that opportunity presented itself. So don't have this attitude. It's, and it's not a Christian attitude to have to be a, a poor worker, to have poor work ethic. Look at what it says in Ephesians 6. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling. In singleness of your heart. Singleness of your heart meaning with purpose, right? As unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleases, right? So you don't just do things because you're worried about how men think of you, right? The higher purpose is what God thinks of you, right? But as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. You see that? This is something that's so important in our entitlement day and age today, where people just think they're entitled to a wage, they're entitled to this, they're entitled to that. The boss owes you a job. The boss does not owe you a job. I know the government makes it so that it feels like the boss owes you a job, right? But you, the boss doesn't owe you a job. You're there to serve in your job, the Bible says here, as though you were serving Jesus Christ. That's the mentality of a Christian employee, right? A Christian employee should never be, you know, complaining and doing the minimum and doing all that. should be excelling at what you do, right? Not just eye services with men, please, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing. Here's our confidence in, in the Lord if we do this, that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. <clears throat> and oftentimes, you know, employees will complain because maybe they, they're not getting what they deserve, and maybe not. But should that change our attitude, right? We can recognize that maybe we're getting underpaid or undervalued, but we still should have an attitude of doing our best whatever job that we find ourselves in. Because you know what? Even if your employer does not reward you for the good work you do, God will. That's what this is saying here. That's why you should work as though you're serving God, because even if you don't get the reward on earth, God will give you the reward uh, in due time. Colossians 3 is the parallel passage. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleases, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, look at this, do it heartily, right? So we're talking about excelling at what you do. Do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. And he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. There is no respect of persons. All right, number three. So number two was, you know, excel at what you do. Number three, one thing we can learn from this story is the importance of, of training your children to serve the Lord. Training your children to serve the Lord. Remember, we always think of Daniel as like these adults, but in chapter one, these were children that were brought out. Can you imagine? Like, you know, as adults, we struggle to take a principled stand to do what's right. And yet these young men, right, these young boys are taking a stand in, in the face of this oppressive government. I mean, they're, they're dealing with quite high level officials, right? These are the king's servants asking them to do things and yet they had the boldness and the wisdom to take a stand for God. So we see here the importance to train our children to serve the Lord. Now, what's, what I find interesting about this passage is, you know, when it comes to a, a, a population, right, there's a certain, you know, uh, birth rate that is required 
to maintain a population. And you would think that, um, well, shouldn't it just be two? If every, every, every couple had two, then the population would just be maintained. But it's not actually two because you have to account for people that don't have children. You have to account for early deaths. You have to account, you know, for people that get sick and you know all that sort of stuff. So the, the birth rate, I think, to maintain a population is like two point something. It's like two point two or two point one. If a population does not have a birth rate per you know person of like two point something, then it actually starts declining the population, right? And this is where you you have a lot of troubles in a declining population. One is you know obviously the nation becomes less strong because there's not as many people, but also the, the number of people needing to be supported by the next generations decreases and decreases and decreases. So it becomes a societal problem as well. So there's a lot of problems with, you know, just a society's not having children. That's why nobody wants to have children these days. And, you know, we're already sort of seeing the effects of like people going old and having nobody to take care of them, right? Because they, they don't have children and all that sort of stuff. They depend on the government more and more. But this is why, you know, ungodly societies eventually like just go extinct right because if they're just killing all their children sacrificing them all to whatever god and just like you know encouraging fornication and not you know monogamous relationships and all this sort of stuff you can see ungodly nations and societies aren't having children of their own right so you can see the mark of an ungodly society is a low value on children Right? So because ungodly societies, they're not always having their own children, what happens? Now they want to take other people's children and start teaching them. Right? I think you know, that happens in a lot of societies. That happens in our societies. And Christians let them do it. You know, like they want, they, the government wants to teach you know, some ungodly officials or whatever, bureaucrats, want to teach our children their ways and their customs and their language and all their things. And then Christians just let them do it. How? By sending them to the public school. Right? The public school and just letting them teach whatever the public school is going to dish up. Right? And we can see here that the government of this time, you know, maybe it makes me wonder, like, why didn't Nebuchadnezzar just get children of the Babylonians? Right? Maybe because it's an ungodly nation that compared to the children of Israel, the children of Israel seem smarter. Or maybe they, you know, there's a picture here of an oppressive nation or a nation wanting to corrupt God's people's children, right here, and get their children and teach them in their ways, you know. And unfortunately, in our day and age, a lot of parents willingly submit to that and do that, you know. And, and unfortunately, the government may, makes it harder and harder, you know, because you want to send them to a private school or a Christian school, and you know, you've got to pay out of pocket. And obviously, homeschooling has its challenges as well. But I definitely think it's worth the challenge. You know, I'm all, I'm all for homeschooling. But I want you to understand that, you know, the mark of an ungodly society is a low value of children, right? Because they don't value them as they ought, like in the Bible, you know, and have many children. I mean, consider the value of children. You know, a lot of people, if your child was sick, or if some, you know, the value of a person, if somebody was sick, I mean, you, you would spend all of the money in the world to try and save that child. Right, but we don't value to have that extra child. Um, but also just think of the, the, the influence children have on future generations. Because you can have all the money in the world, but if you're not even around to influence how that money is spent, what does it matter? Right? So one day, everyone in this room, you know, a lot of us are quite young, but one day we're all going to be gone. And what's going to be left to replace us? It's going to be the children that we bring up, that we train. They're going to be left. They're, they're the future of this country. So you can see that the, 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 the shift in values in a country is, is going to shift in proportion to the children that are brought up in this world. You, you know, you can see, like, well, how many people, how many different, I guess, religions or different nationalities or different cultures or belief systems are having children today? That's going to be Australia in, you know, 30 years' time or in 40 years' time because they're going to be the adults running this place, right? So, you know, the Muslims get this. But Christians don't, you know. And, you know, if we want to maintain a Christian nation, sometimes it's as basic as having children, training them up to serve the Lord and making sure they are the leaders of the future, you know. So we need to train up a child. The Bible says here in Proverbs 22, verse 6, 
Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And I, you know, this verse in Proverbs 22, verse 6, I mean, this is the verse you think of when you think of children being taken from their home and yet they were trained in the, up in the way of the Lord and, and these, Daniel and his three friends, took that stand. When they were older, they did not depart from it. I mean, how great would it be to have your children, you know, God, for, God forbid, you know, them removed from you, but it would be good, good if, they, if they were removed from you, that even out of your presence, they, on their own accord, took the stand and did what's right. I mean, I think that's every parent's dream, right? To just like, you know, raise your children and one day they do great things, even greater than you even imagined, right? That's what you would want. But you've got to train them, right? You've got to teach it. You've got to be that example for them, right? Train, you notice that it's interesting that the Bible uses the word train up a child in the way you should go because a lot of parents, they just like teach their children. They just like, just, it's just words, right? But it, it needs to be your example too. It needs to be your life that you're showing your children like, hey, this is how life should be. Like if you think about when you train for something, when you train for something, do you just do it once? No? When you train for something, do you do it like once when you feel like it every now and then? You know, when you train for something, um, you know, do you just learn about it? Like, you know, like a lot of people that are into jiu-jitsu, right? They just watch, watch lots of videos and they never actually do it. I mean... Is that training just because you're learning about it? It's like here at church, just because you learn from me every week, are you training yourself in the ways of Christianity if you don't actually do it yourself? No, this is just you learning, but the training comes when you actually put it into practice, right? So we need to make sure our kids put it into practice. So when we think about training our kids, and that's why we have to be consistent with going to church, you know, you have children, you want to raise your children, you've got to be consistent going to church and consistent in how you treat church, you know, make sure you're reading your Bible at home because you're training them to know, oh, they recognize the Bible. They recognize it's soul winning. They recognize church is important in life. And then you train up these habits, right? But if we are not consistent ourselves, right, we're not training the, our children up in the way that they should go. And, you know, when they're old, they may depart from it. So, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. So train, you think about it, it's, it's purpose, it's consistency, isn't it? Right? We need to make sure we do that. Um, you know, and it's not just, uh, you know, how to, it's, it's like, um, it's not just coming to spiritual things as well. When you think about training your children, right? When you think about training your children, don't just think about, you know, just church and only that. But it's also just training good habits as well. You know, if you want your children to, to eat neatly, you know, you've got to train that. You know, you've got to be consistent in how you teach them and all that sort of stuff. So training is about just being consistently setting a standard for them. And then that's how you sort of train uh, their, their expectations. And then, you know, the government can one day try and teach them new things. But hopefully, uh, you know, we've done a good job. And, and, and this verse will be true if we have trained them up in the way they should go. Number four is surround yourself with godly friends. Surround yourself with godly friends. We know that Daniel had his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Surround yourself with godly friends. It's very important. Don't underestimate the influence that the people you spend a lot of time with have on you, especially if they're not the type to necessarily encourage you to be in church, encourage you to go soul winning. If you're spending a lot of time with them all the time, I'm not saying you can't spend any time with them, but you need to be aware that of the negative influences in your life, right? Look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Now in the story of Daniel, I mean, can you imagine? I mean, I don't even, we don't even know how many other children were taken amongst the children of Israel that would have been in the training camps with them, in the Babylonian training camps, right? Like, wh what about the, the peer pressure, right? The peer pressure amongst that group. You know what? I think them having a close-knit group of godly friends kept them on the right path. That's why I think it's so important that people, you know, you, know, you come to church. Something, you know, sometimes people, they come to church, and they don't really plug themselves in. You know, they don't really want to get involved, get to know people. Sometimes people just come after the preaching's over, they leave. 
that's a very dangerous situation to be in as a Christian because like here, like we, we don't live in, a, in an ideal circumstance, right? The world is not a godly place. Just like here, they're living under the Babylonian Empire and even amongst the people that were taken out of the children of Israel, how many of them took the stand? Remember when they were getting everyone to bow down to the statue? Where were all the other children of Israel not bowing down? There was only the three, you know, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and um, Azariah. So, you know, so, I lost my point there. I forgot what I was talking about now. So who knows how many other children were there that didn't take the same stand? So I think, it's, yeah, so it's, it's important that we surround ourselves with godly people and even in church that you make sure that you forge good relationships and friendships with people within the church that are encouraging you to to go the right direction you know and and hopefully everyone here is a good influence on each other because just because somebody's in church unfortunately that doesn't always mean that they're a good example right but hopefully all of us think about our own example and our own influence on others in the church so that if somebody were to befriend you, am I the sort of friend that would provide the right type of spiritual support and encouragement and we would push ourselves to do great things like Daniel and his three friends did in this story here. Because God, you know, God did not intend or expect us to go through the challenges in our life alone, right? Some people think like, you know, well, you know, they, they don't want to necessarily, you know, burden other people or rely on other people, whether it's through pride or guilt or anything. But God does not expect us to go through the challenges of life on our own. That's why church is important. That's why church is about people coming together and supporting one another. And it's not about, you know, necessarily burdening other people. It is that, that God has put them in your life to be that support because we all need sometimes to give and to receive support, don't we? Look at what it says here in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. So this is very interesting that, uh, that Solomon here is sort of speaking like from a point of view of, you know, if obviously there's no eternity, but he sees sort of the things that happen in this earth and he's reflecting on, you know, how hopeless they are and things like that and uh, just some observations. But this one is interesting. It says here, he's looking, he sees this vanity under the sun. There is one alone, and there is not a second. Right? So he sees somebody by themselves without somebody with them. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all his labor, neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Right? Riches. So he's saying, so, so, Imagine the picture here. The picture that's being painted here is like the successful career person that has invested their life into the career or their business but doesn't have like any real like true friends or like children, right? And that happens to a lot of people where like their life just became about success and their business relationships are like not really true friends. And then once it's over and done with, They've got like nobody there with them to actually support them to the end of their life. And it's just like such a sad thing that people don't re sort of realize the value of building good relationships or even having children. So it's like they're so busy with working and the labor, they're, they're, not, they're not satisfied with how much money they have. There's so much money, right? But neither saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? So they never even stop to ask, why am I even doing all this like who is going to benefit from all this this is also vanity yea it is a sore travail and then he goes on to say two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor right why because when you when you have these friendships and these relationships when you succeed at something you have somebody to rejoice with for if they fall the one will lift up his fellow but woe to him that is alone when he falleth for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Often people think about that threefold cord. It's often talked about in the terms of marriage, you know, you got husband and wife and then God. 
So a lot of people talk about this threefold chord, like it includes God, right? Because the two is talking about earthly relationships. And then God is that makes that threefold chord, right? So God does not expect us to go through these challenges alone. Even when we look at the story of Elijah in 1 Kings 19, Elijah thought he was alone. It says it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. Look at this. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it. So sometimes we feel alone, just like Elijah did. But look at what God says to Elijah. The Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So you can see here that even with Elijah, Elijah was not alone, right? So he was never, God never leaves us alone. You know, there's always others that are also faithful um, that we can, you know, work together with. But, you know, obviously he, sometimes he can use one person to do a great delivery as well. Number five, we see from Daniel, is purpose in your heart to do right. Purpose in your heart to do right. right. We see here, there's a famous passage from Daniel 1, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Right. So even though Daniel was in a group of four, we see here with him and his three friends, it's interesting that his boldness in the Lord is what spurred his three friends, I think, to you know take that stand. Because sometimes it takes one within the group to take that stand, to motivate and encourage the others within the group to take that stand. And to take a stand, it requires purpose. You need to decide beforehand that you're going to take this stand, whether you, no matter what your feeling is, right? So think about any challenge that you set for yourself in life or any stand that you take. Like you have to purpose beforehand in your heart to take that stand. Otherwise you may like falter, you know, you may quit. Because you can't, you can't, just, defend, you can't just depend on how you feel at the time. Right? Because if you do, then likely you, you're not gonna feel like it. Because anything that is challenging in life or anything that requires any sort of contention or com conflict, it's never going to be comfortable. So having the mindset of, yeah, well, when I feel like it one day or when I feel right, then I'm going to do it, that day may just never happen, right? Because the less you do it, the less you'll feel like doing it. And the more uncomfortable things get, the more out of practice you are in it. And it's no different to taking a stand in your life for principles that you may believe in or just doing things for God, you know, going out soul winning. You know, the less you do it, the less you take that stand. You know, you, you wait until you feel like doing it. You never will feel like doing it, right? So you can't just depend on how you feel like doing something, right? Because if it's a challenge, it's not going to be comfortable. And um, if you don't decide to do it beforehand, you may never do it. Now, what I want you to think about here in Daniel's life, you know, we know Daniel about, you know, the great things he did before the king, the dreams, the interpretations, and even more so, you know, when they outlawed prayer in the Medo-Persian Empire, that he just went ahead and did it anyway, right? But what I want you to see here in Daniel chapter 1, because I'm not talking about those stories, is that even before he did those great things for God, he took a stand privately amongst in this situation. So you, the stand that you take, it, it's got to start somewhere and it's got to start small. You know, don't kid yourself that, oh, you know, I'm going to do great things for God and I'm going to like, you know, I want to accomplish these things for God. But then, you know, you, you can't even say no 
like to, to your boss, right? When he gets you to work on Sunday. You know, you can't even say like no to your family when they have something on Sundays. You know, you can't even like say no. You know, I can't think of any other situations, but you know what I mean? Like, if you're going to take the stand now, you know, let's say your family wants you to go along to some like pagan Orthodox Catholic ritual, you know, and you don't, e you don't even have the, the wisdom and the boldness to say no now. You know, don't think you're going to be able to say no when your life is on the line, you know, when there's more at stake. So you got to see here that when, when we take that stand, it's got to start with the smaller things. It's not like Daniel just came out of the gate and he's like, you know, talking with the king. and everything. These are, A lot of these things when he took these bigger stands came later on in his life. But you see here, this is where it started, right? And it's the same with David. Think of David and Goliath. It always starts with the smaller battles first, right? You need to be able to, to run with the footmen before you can contend with horses, right? 1 Samuel 17, look what David says. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered him out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing as he had defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. So even in the story of David, David's story when he fought Goliath is a very famous story. But you can see here that David didn't just come out of the gate and then just face the giant, right? He's saying here that even privately when he's tending the sheep, that a lion and the bear tried to come and take his sheep and he defended his sheep and overcame that small challenge. And that's what gave him the confidence and the boldness to overcome those larger challenges. But don't kid yourself that you think it'll be the other way around, right? That if you can't handle the small things, don't think you're going to be able to handle the big things, right? So make a commitment, you know, and be consistent. Think about the story of Daniel, even in chapter 1. You remember, they made the commitment that they would not defile themselves with the king's meat, and they did that for three years, right? A lot of people, you know, they get in church or they start something, they do it for a couple of months, you know, do it for a year, and then they, they get off. Right? That there's not that discipline and that mastery there that God wants from us. But if we're going to be like Daniel, we need to make a commitment and we need to be consistent. You know, you need to be willing to be faithful and go through the grind, right? See, because anybody can start something. Anybody can just start doing something when it's fun and when it's interesting. And then, but you know the difference between people that are, you know, that accomplish great things and people that don't is just the discipline to keep doing it. You know, even when I, even, I know I always use examples in jiu-jitsu because I'm kind of just, you know, that's, that's sort of where I'm at the moment. But I found it very interesting that when I was learning a bit more about jiu-jitsu, it's like a lot of people that do jiu-jitsu, they quit at blue belts. Why? Because when you go through white belt, you're like learning a lot of things. The progress is really fast. And then when you, when you receive your blue belt, usually that's at a point where you've sort of mastered all the fundamental techniques. Right, And then the gains from that point onwards, from blue belt to black belt, are a lot smaller. And generally the people that reach black belt are the people that are just disciplined enough to just keep showing up and keep going. But this is why you get a lot of people quit at blue belt. And when I realized and learned about that statistic, I just thought, wow, like it's just, you know, these things just happen across life because that's what it's like in church too. You know, people go to church, they start going to church, start learning, right? And then... They, they learn, they feel like, oh, you know, they're learning this, they're getting, but then when they feel like they've learned it all, now it's no longer fun and interesting. Now it's actually the grind of you honing your skills and becoming a master at the craft of Christianity. And that takes work, that takes discipline, that takes commitment, and, you know, not everyone's got it in them, you know, but, but in, in our flesh, 
But in Christ, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But that's why it requires a commitment. It requires that discipline um, to be like Daniel here, right? To, to accomplish those great things for God. Because you know what, guys? The grind is not pleasant, right? That's why we have to, we have to love God enough to be willing to go through that grind. I know Steve Jobs was not the best uh, you know, example for us, but even when he talks about business and he talks about people successful in business, he thinks, he teaches that the people that are successful, they have to love what they do because to be successful at something, if you don't have enough love for it, you're not going to go through that grind, right? And it's the same in Christianity. That's why, you know, what other people think about you, or you know your own benefits that you get in life, or whatever, or you know even pressure from me, that's not going to be enough to keep you on the Christian track. You know what's going to keep you disciplined and on the Christian track is if you love God enough that even when it's not pleasant, you do it anyway, right? And that's the reality of Christianity. Don't kid yourself that Christianity is a is a pleasant experience. It's not because, like I said, once you get your blue belt in Christianity, it's a grind. But you know what? That grind is required for you to be a great person of God and it'll be worth it all in the end. Last thing I want to say here is number six, wisdom follows obedience. Wisdom follows obedience. In Daniel chapter one, it says here, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, did this happen before David, uh, Daniel purposed in his heart and took the stand and obeyed God? Or did it happen after? It happened after, didn't it? But most Christians got to have it the other way around. They think, like, you know, think about with soul winning. How many times have I heard people say, well, once I learn enough, once I'm ready, once I do, then I will try and obey God. But it's the other way around. You know what? If you try and bear fruit for God and you're obedient, that's when God's going to give you more wisdom to bear more fruit. You know, so we don't want to have it the other way around where we think, I'm waiting for God to bless me with knowledge and with skills and abilities to use them to serve Him. No, I obey God with what I've got and then God's going to give me more wisdom and more abilities here like we see with Daniel. So it starts with obedience, right? Psalm 111 verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Look at this. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. So just like in Daniel's, they, they didn't take the stand because God had given them wisdom. They took the stand and then God gave them more wisdom. And then think about, you know, that's why he was able to interpret the dreams and the visions and, and uh, took the stand later on. And yeah, so... Remember that, that wisdom follows obedience. All right, so those are the six things we talked about today. Dare to be a Daniel. Don't be a victim of your circumstances. You know, Daniel was in an unideal circumstances. Don't let that hold you back. You know, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can make the most of the situation you're in. You can still do great things for God no matter what your past is. Excel at what you do. Don't have a poor attitude, an unchrist like attitude of always doing the minimum. Excel at whatever you do, wherever you are. Right? Train your children to serve the Lord. So our example is very important. Consistency is very important. Right? And having standards for our children. Surround yourself with godly friends. Don't think you have to go through the challenges of life alone and beware of bad influences in your life. Right? Purpose in your heart to do right because it's going to re require some resolve right, to go through that grind. Don't just do things based on how you feel because by nature, challenges are, are, are not comfortable to do. And wisdom follows obedience. If you want to learn, you want to know more about God, you want to get closer to God, obey God. Right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Right? And a good understanding, look at this, have all they that do His commandments, His praise endureth forever. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. We thank you for the example of Daniel. Uh, it's always an encouragement to us, Lord, that uh, you know they were not in an ideal circumstance, but Lord, they had, the, they had the boldness and the wisdom to take a stand for you. I pray, Lord, you help us to do the same. 
Uh, Lord, help um, us to dare to be like Daniel. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.